So now they're saddled with this incredible debt that they can't possibly pay. And so we go in and demand our pound of flesh, very much like the mafia. That's why we called ourselves hitmen. And so today, for example, this is actually what's happened in Ecuador. And, and today, um, we need Ecuador's oil. We need the oil from this Amazon area where these indigenous people live that I work with as a Peace Corps volunteer. And we tell Ecuador, since you can't pay off your loans, what you need to do is turn over your Amazon to our oil companies. And that's what they're doing. And the indigenous people there, the ones I worked with now, have basically declared war. They said, we're not allowing these oil companies to come in. We're going to fight to the very last man if we have to. It's a terrible situation. And what it is all about is building empire. We've done this in every country around the world that has resources that we covet. Often this is oil in places like Indonesia, Nigeria, uh, Ecuador, Venezuela, Colombia, so many different places, but sometimes it's other resources. For example, in Panama, it was the Panama Canal. And in this process, we've managed to create the largest empire in the history of the world, and we've done it largely without military might. It's been done primarily through economic hitmen like me. Now, when the economic hitmen fail, as we've done some, as we did in Panama with Omar Torrijos and in Ecuador many years ago with Jaime Roldos when I was there. When we fail, the jackals are sent in. And these are CIA sanctioned troublemakers. They, they will try to foment coups in a country. They'll try to overthrow the president. If they fail, if they're not able to do that, then they'll assassinate him. And Jaime Roldos of, of Panama, who was not overthrown, so he was assassinated. And uh, and uh, Omar Torrijos, of, uh, Jaime Rolos of Ecuador, Omar Torrijos of Panama, uh, the same thing happened. We economic hitmen failed, the jackals went in and assassinated these presidents. It happened with Allende in Chile, Arbenz in, in, in Guatemala, uh, it's part of what Vietnam was about, and, and when the jackals fail and the economic hitmen both fail, as in Iraq, the, the final step is for us to send in our young men and women to die and to kill and that's what we're doing in Iraq today. All right, I want to back up a bit and go back to when you're a young man and you're being uh, initially uh, trained by Claudine. What was involved in that? How long did that take? And Claudine's training of me took a number of months. Uh, it was about nine months between the time when Maine hired me and I and I and I went on my first assignment to Indonesia, and Claudine was training me during a great deal of that time, on and off. All of my training occurred in this uh, very uh, plush apartment, small apartment, but very plush on Beacon Street in Boston. Our headquarters, Maine's headquarters, was the Prudential Center in Boston, and this was very close to there. Uh, it was never done in our offices. It was very, very clandestine. I would spend tremendous amounts of time at Cla Claudine's apartment, and she um, she d seduced me in every every possible way. I was very seducible. She was gorgeous. She was intelligent. She was sensual. She was an amazing woman. And at the same time, she told me in no uncertain terms what was to be expected of me as an economic hitman, and told me that and she she called it a dirty business. And she said, we need to make sure that you're totally comfortable doing this and going off and doing this. If you're not comfortable doing it, then don't do it. Don't, don't go to Indonesia. Don't take on this assignment. Because once you're in, you're in for life. You can't turn back. So part of her training of me was to seduce me into it, but at the same time make absolutely certain that I was buying into it, that I was going to be a part of it. And it's your belief that she had had access to the information that the NSA had gotten out of you during the polygraph tests? Correct. I have no doubt about that. She knew what my weaknesses were. She zeroed right in on them. I, I grew up uh, the son of a prep school teacher in, in a private school in New Hampshire and uh, lived on the campus all my life. My dad didn't get paid much money at all. Everything was free. Our house was free. Our food was free. The, mo the lawns were mowed for us. The snow plowed. Everything was free. So we lived a pretty decent life, but I never had any cash. And I was surrounded all my life by boys who came from very, very wealthy families all over the world. And I heard their stories. And then I went to school with these, with these boys. And they would go home on vacation to Venezuela, to Caracas, to... Beirut to London to wherever they were from and, and 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 I would be stuck in this little campus all by myself in Tilton, New Hampshire and uh, very lonely and, and uh, 
uh, I, I'd basically been rejected by the town, and I'd rejected the town because there was animosity between the townies and the preppies, and, and I saw myself as a preppy. So I, I, some of it was self-imposed. But these guys would come back from their vacations with these amazing stories to tell, you know, the debutante balls they'd been to and the, the orgies. And, and, you know, my life was so boring, and I, I developed this, this complex that I really wanted to excel, and I wanted to live that kind of a life. Then I went to Middlebury College, and much of the same there. That, that There were a lot of wealthy people at Middlebury. So I had this desire, and I was extremely shy around women, incredibly shy around women, and pathetically shy around women. And, and I had this this complex, and Claudine knew this. The, the NSA had identified this, and Claudine appealed to every side of it. You know, she, oh man, you know, it was just amazing. And then... As an economic hitman, I traveled always first class. I rode up in the bump of the 747s, you know, I was always first class. Stayed in the best hotels wherever I went, sometimes the best suites in the best hotels. Ate at the best restaurants. Wined and dined around the world by people like the Shah of Iran and the presidents of various countries. I spent time with Robert McNamara, the president of the World Bank. Um, it was quite a life. It was everything I'd ever dreamed about having, really. It was, it was the realization of my fantasies. So tell us about your first assignment in Indonesia. Yes, I was sent to Indonesia as part of a team of 11 men who were there to um, design an electrical system for, the, for Java, the island of Java, which was the most heavily populated piece of real estate in the world at the time. Now, the reason we were going to Indonesia, this is in the early 70s, it was, uh, it was pretty obvious that by then that Vietnam was going to fall. And the theory was the, the domino theory, that if Vietnam fell, then the rest of the Southeast Asian countries would fall, too. And we had to stop that. We were losing in Vietnam. We had to figure out a different way, not the military solution. And Indonesia was seen as the key to this. Um, Indonesia had a lot of oil, so that was important. It had, it had a, a huge population of people. It was a very populated country. Uh, and it had the largest population of uh, Muslims of any country in the world. And so there were many good reasons for us to go into Indonesia. So we had we went into Indonesia and did this study and, 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 and these projections showing that if they built up their electrical system, if they took a huge loan from the Asian Development Bank and the World Bank and built up their electrical system, their economy would boom over the next two, two decades. And we arranged for the loan from the banks. And basically what we were doing was was bringing Indonesia into our realm. We were saddling them with huge debts. We were going to use our own companies, and we did, to build these systems. So the money, you know, we arranged for the World Bank to make a loan to Indonesia. The money came to our corporations in the United States. Indonesia ended up with all this amazing debt. Now, I, I should say, Mike, that um, I was the only person on that 11-man team that knew uh, the subtleties of what we were doing. I was the only economic hitman. I was the economist. I was the one who did all the forecasts. I was the one to arrange the loans. It was that all fell on me. The other men on that team were designing power plants, were designing the highways to, and, and and ports to bring the fuels in to fuel the power plants, designing transmission lines, distribution systems, that sort of work. And throughout the industry, when I talk about these other companies, the Bechtels, the Halliburtons, the Sona Websters, the Charles T. Maines, I want to, and, and the World Bank, I want to make it very clear that the majority of the people working for those organizations are not economic hitmen. They are technicians. They're engineers. Uh, they're doing what they believe is their job of designing systems. And But there's always somebody at the top, there's always somebody in that organization that has a complete understanding of what's going on. It's very few people. Most of these people are in the dark about this, and they shouldn't be in the dark about it. I mean, it should be pretty obvious to them what they're doing, as it should be pretty obvious to all of us in this country where our tax money's going. It isn't that obvious. The system is an amazingly subtle and an incredibly effective system. But wasn't there one person on your team in Indonesia who did seem to have an inkling of that things weren't entirely right? Howard Parker, um, retired executive with the New England Electric System. Um, yeah, he 
you know, he'd spent his life resisting pressure from others, and he was a very bitter man at this point. He had never been promoted to where he thought he should be in the New England electric system. He'd retired and come to work for Maine as a consultant, and, and, and he knew what we, what we were trying to do. We were trying to inflate all these forecasts. I was, I was giving the assignment of making sure that I showed that economic and, and load electric power growth would grow something around 17% a year, which is a huge number when you compound this over 20, 25 years. Howard was determined that it wouldn't be more than 6 or 8%, as he, as he said. That's, that's the norm. And I kept arguing, but, but this isn't the norm. This is a country that's booming. And, and yeah, I, 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 I talk in a great deal of detail about Howard and how angry he was. But from my standpoint, Howard, also, Howard was a bitter old man, and he hadn't got what he wanted out of life. And he wasn't going to be around there long. So what I wanted to do is learn all I could from him and basically take over his.